Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Romano. I'm the Education Coordinator with the Sport Base Hospital. Thank you for joining us for another webinar presentation. This one happens to be part two in a series of three on uh, ECG interpretation. So this time we're going to get into a little bit more detail about 12 lead ECGs and some MI imitators. Uh, today presenting, we have Christine Hardy, who's a paramedic educator with SWARP. We have Justine Jewell, who's a nurse and CBRN specialist here with SWARP as well. And Dr. Matt Davis, the interim uh, medical director for education with the base hospital as well. Uh, if it's your first time joining us for a webinar, you'll see a control panel along with a PowerPoint presentation. On that control panel, uh, you'll be able to see a hand icon and a question box. Go ahead and use the question box throughout the presentation to type any questions to us that you might have. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up to any live questions, which is when you'll be able to use that hand icon, uh, which I'll explain again at the end of the presentation. Uh, be aware that we do have a few poll questions throughout, so stay close to your computer and, uh, and participate, answer those poll questions. Um, if uh, any of you are sitting with uh, a colleague or a co-worker and you'd like CE points for them, also send that to me through the, the question box. Um, if anyone is listening or watching via um, a phone or a tablet, I don't believe you can answer the poll questions, but feel free to send me your answers through the chat box as well and we'll log them that way. Uh, and so without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Christine, Justine, and Matt. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Steph. The goals of today's webinar are to revisit the application of the Cardiac Ischemia Medical Directive, investigate advanced 12-lead interpretation and MI imitators, and to review PSVT, SVT, and tachydysrhythmias. Upon the completion of the webinar, the paramedic should be able to identify key teaching points related to the application of the Cardiac Ischemic Medical Directive, identify advanced 12-lead and MI imitators, and apply them to pre-hospital care, and relate tachydysrhythmias to patient complaints and the application of the ALS directives. We would like to start off today's webinar by introducing or reintroducing you to our Ask Mac uh, resource available on our website. It provides paramedics with valuable resources in a question and answer style forum, is searchable using keywords, and provides an anonymous way that paramedics can ask questions and receive consistent and reliable information that comes directly from the Medical Advisory Committee. Please remember that uh, feel free to contact a regional paramedic educator at any time as well with any questions you may have. So this particular question displayed on your screen is one that's been asked frequently by paramedics, especially since the introduction and the evolution of the STEMI bypass protocols. So the question asked was, under the Cardiac Ischemic Medical Directive, it states that indications for nitro and ASA are suspected cardiac ischemia. My question is, a patient without chest pain but has other symptoms such as weakness or shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, etc., and a positive 12 lead showing either ST elevation or depression, do they qualify for nitro under this protocol? So the answer, as posted by the Medical Advisory Committee, um, is giving you direction that's consistent throughout the region. So coupling your symptoms with a positive 12 lead is important, but making sure that your patient is experiencing discomfort uh, related to cardiac ischemia would lead us to treat the patient under the medical directive. So there's lots of reasons why a patient may have these symptoms, you know, just generally feeling unwell, feeling nauseated, vomiting. Um, short of breath, but in order to qualify for the cardiac ischemia protocol, they need to have some degree of, of chest discomfort. Um, with the luxury we have in the emergency department is, you know, you get an ECG which does show ST elevation. Well, there's many different causes of ST elevation, not just STEMI, and we have the ability to look at all ECGs as well to help in, in comparing them. So as, although they could be, you know, cardiac uh, ischemic equivalents, uh, despite you know, them having this in the field, they would not qualify to be treated under the cardiac ischemia protocol. So let's take a look at a case study. Uh, you're on scene treating a 64-year-old patient who's feeling unwell and is complaining of mild shortness of breath with scapular pain, burning sensation in the left shoulder. The patient denies any other complaints and has not experienced recent assault or trauma and has no past medical history. We're going to open our first poll question at this time. 
So you perform a 12 lead on this patient. So take a second, guys. Answer either yes or no. We've got 50% of the audience voted right now, so we'll give you a few more seconds to, uh, to get your answers logged in. Okay, so we've closed that poll, and it's showing that 100% uh, of the people who voted answered yes. Okay, that's great. Um, part of the confusion surrounding our uh, new directives is that in our previous set of directives, there was a specific 12-lead acquisition protocol which specified when an ECG should be presented. In our most recent directives, there's no longer a dedicated 12-lead ECG protocol. So our direction has been from the Medical Advisory Committee that a 12-lead ECG should be performed where indicated in the new care standards, but that this is considered the minimum standard. Liberal use of our 12-lead ECG is, a re is reasonable as long as it can be required in a reasonable time frame, um, i.e. not prolonging scene time, and the patient's hemodynamically stable. If you want more information about the 12-lead ECG, there, we have a previous webinar on our website on on the topic, um, and you can read it under November 2011. So this patient absolutely would uh, be treated with oxygen, cardiac monitor, and 12 lead. The vital signs uh, were reported as 110 strong and regular, blood pressure 140 and 90, the respiratory rate uh, 20, 20 regular and 12, and the chest was clear on auscultation. So this certainly sounds suggestive of cardiac cardiac ischemia, and with additional information, the patient, uh, the paramedic would treat, uh, make a treatment decision and, and go forward with their directive. Keeping in mind, the purpose of our 12-lead ECG is early reperfusion in our patients and is a piece of information to create a bigger picture. So our next poll question, what areas of the heart are displaying injury? Okay, so the answers you have up there are inferior, anterior septal, septal lateral, or anterior lateral. A little trickier question, so we'll leave it up here for a few more seconds. I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting a couple questions from you asking to have seen this strip longer. Unfortunately, if I close the poll, I can't reopen it. So if we do this again, we'll, uh, we'll definitely show the strip a little longer. All right, so we're going to close that and share the results. So we have 27% uh, saying inferior, 27% saying anterior septal, 18% saying septal lateral, and 27% anterior lateral. So obviously the answers are uh, pretty equal across the board. So this is an ugly looking ECG. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that, that jumps out is the huge ST eleva elevation across all precordial leads, B1 through B6. You'll also notice that there's ST elevation in 1 and AVL. This is in keeping with um, an anterolateral MI. And yes, the septal leads are involved, B1, B2. Um, but just in terms of, of terminology, this is known as an anterolateral MI. You'll also notice that in leads 2, 3, and AVF, there is ST depression. And this is in keeping with the reciprocal changes you'd expect to find with this type of ST elevation MI. So in looking at this ECG, um, again, this is a lot of nice to know, not, not necessarily need to know type of information. Um, but the, the vessel that would be occluded would be the left anterior descending vessel. So if the patient were to receive fibronolysis or go to the, the cath lab, the culprit lesion would probably be sitting in the LAD lesion, or sorry, the LAD vessel. So 
So to discuss our treatment plans, we first need to decide whether we're, we're seeing signs and symptoms of cardiac ischemia and the patient's complaints relate to that. Um, we've had questions lately about nitroglycerin treatment. When should we be treating our patients with nitro? And the answer seems obvious, except in the setting where we have a positive STEMI uh, 12-week ECG. Um, your directive is that there should be a complaint of chest pressure or pain or that the patient is presenting with their typical symptoms of cardiac ischemia. However, with for ASA administration, if your patient's complaints are suggestive of cardiac ischemia, with or without the associated chest pressure or pain, it would be appropriate to treat them at that time. Activation of the STEMI bypass protocol uh, is based on your patient presenting with chest pressure or, or chest pain. However, Matt will discuss uh, if your patient presents with a positive STEMI and what you should do at that time. So if the, the ECG reads uh, ST elevation MI, acute MI, um, in order for them to qualify as having a STEMI, they must have a component of chest discomfort with that. Again, there's many imitators which can, sometimes can even fool the ECG computer into calling an ST elevation MI. So there must be a, a, direct, uh, a direct episode that is related to the ST elevation MI of chest discomfort occurring at the time. So one of the questions I've been frequently asked, uh, and as a challenging of teaching new material relating to our practice, is paramedics know more now about the pre-hospital ECG than when it was first introduced. And our new directives have so many gray areas. Bottom line, what are the expectations? So certain things that you may see on the ECG, um, you have signs of ischemia, which can present as ST depression or T wave in, inversion. Uh, you can also get uh, prolonged ischemia, which is injury to the myocardium, and this presents as ST elevation, as well as inf infarction. So you can get ST elevation as well as the development of pathological Q waves. Okay, and the bottom line is that you will be performing 12 lead ECGs when it is indicated and you will be required to activate the STEMI protocol when it is required. Here's a brief review of your contiguous leads. Uh, this is from ECG portion one. However, um, it's something that you will need to review frequently um, and do in a systematic manner when you're looking at your 12 lead ECGs. So the hot topic became uh, the inferior MI, nitroglycerin administration and the inferior MI. Which brings us to our next poll question. Nitroglycerin is contraindicated in a patient with an inferior MI, true or false? We've got about 60% of the audience voted. Give me a few more seconds. All right, so results show that 40% of you have said true and 60% have said false. Okay, um, so that's good um, because this brings up uh, a great topic. Um, in fact, Nitroglycerin is not contraindicated in the setting of an inferior MI. Um, if your patient is within the parameters of nitroglycerin administration in terms of blood pressure and heart rate, it should be administered. However, um, it is intelligent to consider there could be some right-sided involvement and the, the paramedic should possibly start an IV. I'm going to pass this along to Matt right now to discuss the right ventricular infarct, its incidence, and how, you're, how you recognize it. So the ECG up on the screen does show ST elevation in the inferior leads in keeping with an inferior MI. Um, you'll notice 2, 3, and ABF have F, ST elevation, and you'll have reciprocal depression in your high laterals, as well as across B5 and B6. 
sorry, B6 is starting to get some ST elevation as well, but across your precordial leads, you're getting some ST depression in keeping with these reciprocal changes. In terms of inferior MIs, you're right to think about the right ventricle. And the reason for that is that the right coronary artery, which supplies the inferior or bottom portion of the heart, also often supplies the right ventricle of the heart. Um, patients with a right ventricle infarct are preload dependent, meaning that when the right ventricle is not working well, is not able to pump blood well, and they can often they can often go into uh, failure because of this. They often present with um, hypotension uh, in this regard. <clears throat> so the thought is, if you give a patient who's having a right ventricle infarct nitroglycerin, you're going to cause preload. You're going to decrease your preload, and as a result, the patient's going to become hypotensive. However, only about 40% of inferior MIs actually have right ventricular involvement. So the other way of looking at that is 60% of inferior MIs have no problem with their right ventricle. And the result of withholding nitroglycerin from these patients, um, you're, actually, you're actually withholding symptom relief from them. So the protocol is designed to help, help exclude these patients who have a right ventricular involvement because what's going to happen is the way they're going to present is hypotensive. And going back to your cardiac ischemic protocol, if they fall outside the parameters, they can withhold nitroglycerin. If for some reason their pressure is within normal limits and you give nitroglycerin and they become hypotensive, then that's an indication to give them a fluid bolus. Okay. One way of identifying these right ventricular infarct is performing a different type of ECG, um, and we do not perform that in the field. So again, here's another, S, okay, here's another ECG looking at um, ST elevation MI, an inferior MI. Again, looking at the inferior leads, you see ST elevation in those leads. Now what's happening with this ECG is this is what we do in the emergency departments. We do a right-sided lead. So we move, we move B4 over to the right side of the heart so it's sitting beside B1. And this is how we can pick up a right ventricle infarct. And if you look at B4R, meaning on the right side, there is ST elevation. So this would be an inferior MI with right ventricle involvement. So how does this patient present? Um, typically, they have chest discomfort or pressure. Uh, diaphoretic, they could be weak with nausea and vomiting, and a hypotensive. They typically have cleared lung sounds and JVD. It's very difficult to combine these signs and symptoms in the field, and again, um, that type of 12 lead is not performed by paramedics in the field um, to confirm the presence of the right-sided, um, the right ventricular infarct. So this somewhat leads us into our cardiogenic shock protocol. Um, the indications for its use are a STEMI-positive 12 lead and cardiogenic shock. This patient is extremely hypotensive and requires fluid to increase their pre preload so they're adequately perfused. Should you be presented with a sick patient who's showing a STEMI on the 12 lead printout, follow the cardiogenic shock protocol. The key here is to keep in mind that the STEMI bypass protocol indicates a hypotensive patient is excluded from transport to a bypass site. This is even in the setting when you have bolused your patient and you've accomplished raising the blood pressure to an adequate level. It's important to remember once they're out of a, of a, of a protocol, they no longer can come back in. So our poll question, the following signs and symptoms of car are car signs of cardiogenic shock except confusion, increased urinary output, pale skin, and bacteria. We're sitting at about 50%, so we'll wait for a few more responses. Okay, so results show that 
shows uh, increased urinary output and 12% confusion. Um, so we hope the correct answer is um, increased urinary output. Uh, we're hoping that through our Ask Mac and our production of numerous webinars that we're helping you through your tough decisions. However, we need to hear from you in order to address the clinical challenges you face. So right now we're asking you to post some questions anonymously so we can address them live. And we'd like to just give you a couple minutes. What we'll do is uh, read the question aloud and answer. So if, there, if there's a particular call you've had or a situation that you found challenging, we wish to address it um, live. If anyone has a question that they'd like to ask live, just raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. And I can see that. So I do have a couple hands up. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to unmute you. So Jeff, you're now unmuted. So go ahead and ask your question. Jeff, can you hear us? All right, so that's not going to work. And I did have another one, but unfortunately the, the medic doesn't have a mic. So uh, no hands up at this time, guys. Can they type in a message? So throughout the presentation, you can go ahead and type in a question. Uh, and Stephanie will go ahead and you can read that for us and we'll answer it as we go along. We're going to continue on with the presentation. If any questions come up, please feel free to ask. Or visit Ask Mac and you can post your question there. So access deviation, if you ever picked up a 12 lead ECG textbook, there's a whole big chapter on access deviation. So I just want to briefly touch on what access deviation is, how to recognize it, and why do we really care about it. So to determine access, look at your lead 1 and ABF. Uh, in a normal patient, the, it, it, these two leads are uh, positive polarity. So for left axis deviation, uh, we're looking for a negative QRS deflection in AVF, as uh, shown here in the circles. In your right axis deviation, you're looking for negative polarity in lead 1. So normally you would only see positive, you will have a negative deflection there. In severe right axis deviation, you will have negative polarity in both 1 and AVF. So the big question is, uh, why do we care about access determination? And basically, it's a nice to know, not a need to know, but it gets you thinking about uh, what else could be happening with this patient. So it gives you ideas of differential diagnosis to consider. So with left access deviation, you can uh, look for left bundle branch block or left atrial hypertrophy. In right access deviation, uh, it could indicate a right bundle branch block or a pulmonary embolism. And with both uh, right access and left access, you could, it could be caused by COPD, hyperkalemia, MI, or, or possibly WPW. So now we're going to visit some uh, AMI imposters. So what are the most common ones we'll see, and how do we uh, distinguish between, between uh, whether or not it's an MI or it's one of these imposters? So the ones we are going to discuss today are ventricular hypertrophy, bundle branch blocks, uh, some certain medications, and pericarditis. So what AMI imposters do is they may produce ST elevation, ST depression, tall T waves, or inverted T waves, but they also may hide these, so it may mask the signs of an MI uh, by having one of these imposters present. So we'll discuss more of these in the future. What I want you to really think about, and the key message to bring home here, is the presence of an imitator does not rule out acute coronary syndrome. So you always want to err on the side of acute coronary syndrome when you're assessing your patient. So the first imposter we're going to look at is left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and this is usually in, is caused by enlarged left ventricle. Um, left ventricular hypertrophy can mask uh, and or mimic all ECG changes associated with ACS. Uh, most are the result of either the left ventricle working harder over a longer period of time or the result of chronic overfilling. 
So LVH does not usually widen the QRS. Instead of abnormally widening the QRS, uh, LVH increases its amplitude. So when you look at your 12-lead uh, ECG, you will see tall or uh, long QRSs in, uh, in your V-lead, in your precordial leads. So the key message is narrow QRS compass with increased amplitude. And here's an example of what that will look like. So there are many formulas for suspecting the pre presence of uh, LVH. It involves counting the amount of negative and positive deflections uh, or the, the amount of amplitude in the negative positive deflections in V1 or V2. So you assess which one is longer, which one is bigger, and you count uh, the amount of uh, millimeters. Uh, each QRS complex is. Uh, if these add up to greater than 35 millimeters, um, left ventricular hypertrophy is indicated. Um, this is an example. So here you can see in V2, which is quite large, and then if you compare uh, V5 and V6, if you count them up, you get approximately 50 millimeters, which is uh, indicative of left ventricular hypertrophy. This ECG also shows SD segment elevation in the right precordial leads in V1, V2, and V3. So you'll note that the ST segments are upwardly concave and the severity of the ST segment elevation and T wave height is proportional to the depth of the S wave. So uh, it grows as the, as the QRS gets longer. So with left ventricular hypertrophy, the, the deeper the QRS complex, the higher the ST segment and more pronounced the T wave abnormality. So this is also true if the ST segment depression and T wave inversion typically found in the, in the lateral leads the higher the R wave, the deeper the ST segment depression, and more pronounced the inverted T wave. So on this slide over here. So now we're turning our attention to bundle branch blocks. We covered a little bit on bundle branch blocks in our ECG part one. We're just expanding a little bit on it. So uh, it can, bundle branch blocks can be pre-existing condition or can, can be caused by acute coronary syndrome. A bundle branch block can both mimic and mask the ECG changes used to identify your MI. The QRS is widened by the bundle branch block due to asynchronous firing of the ventricle. Unless there is evidence of a worsening uh, conduction, like syncope or dropped beat, then these conditions are non-emergent. But a bundle branch block can also be caused by acute coronary syndrome. So when you have a bundle branch that is caused by ACS, it, it identifies a higher risk patient. So what you will see with the bundle branch block is you'll see a widened QRS, so greater than that 0 0.12 seconds. And your QRS morphology will change. So it varies depending on which type of block you're looking at. So we're going to look at our V leads. V1 is the most common we're going to look at. Um, and you're looking at the tail end. And we're using our car signal as, to determine whether or not it's right bundle branch or left bundle branch. So if you draw your line uh, back backwards from the end of your complex, and you're turning your signal up, then it's a right bundle branch block. And when you're drawing your line back from the end of your complex, and you're turning your signal down, then it's a left bundle branch. So you're looking at your tails. So for this one here, is it a right or a left bundle? There's no pull question, but just take a minute to look at it. So if you look at V1, when you draw your line backwards, which way you're turning, I'm turning right, I don't know if there's anybody else. So it's your right bundle branch. And for this one here, again, drawing backwards, turning your signal down, that's to your left, so it's the left bundle. So remembering that your bundle branch blocks, they must have a wide QRS. So what are some causes of bundle branch blocks? We've got coronary artery disease. Uh, cardiomyopathy, possibly myocarditis, hypertension, scar tissue, post-cardiac surgery, and some causes are congenital. So the next imposter we're going to look at is the DIG effect, so the medication effect. So the classic sign for your uh, digoxin is the swoop characteristic uh, of your ST segment, so this ST depression here. And the key to remember here, here is these changes are, are very subtle, so you probably wouldn't suspect it without getting a patient history and getting that medication profile to say, oh, a patient's on DIG, and that's why you're seeing. 
So the next imposter is pericarditis. And there are numerous causes of pericarditis. These patients often complain of chest pain, which is an indication for a 12 lead. The classic pericarditis presentation uh, has some distinguishing features. Um, the purpose of the following description is not to rule out acute MI, but to help the care provider suspect whether or not pericarditis is a possibility. So the classic presentation is your sharp chest pain. Um, usually it's stabbing in nature, not like an intense feeling, but like a sharp stabbing pain. Pain can often, often be localized. Uh, it may radiate to the base of the neck or between the shoulder blades. It may increase with coughing, swallowing, deep breathing, or lying flat and may be relieved by sitting up or leaning forward. One of the tricks to suspect pericarditis is to lean them forward and see if the pain improves. Um, pericarditis can also occur post-MI or post-cardiac surgery, and also have a high index of suspicion if the patient has had a recent viral or bacterial infection or is an IV drug uh, abuser. So the changes you may see are uh, it, when it relates to uh, ST changes, as you may see ST elevation with pericarditis, uh, it's caused by the inflammation of the epicardium, secondary to inflammation of the pericardium. This process is not related to coronary artery disease, and therefore the ST changes do not tend to follow the anatomical groupings typically seen in acute coronary syndrome. So keep that in mind. That's the key there. Pericarditis may produce a notching or J-point, uh, or also known as a fish hook shape ST uh, segment. So this little picture here is indicative of that. So this is a uh, ECG that shows the global ST elevation, so an example of pericarditis. Um, but on your, your um, it may be mistaken or your ECG machine may be mis mistake this as an ST elevation MI. So keeping in mind when you're looking at it, you're looking for those anatomical groupings. So there's a few interesting things on this ECG that indicate that this is in fact pericarditis. Again, as what Justine alluded to, there's diffuse ST elevation across most leads here. Um, but also in keeping with uh, pericarditis, if you look at the PR intervals, you'll notice that there's PR downsloping right before the QRS. And this is in keeping with pericarditis. Also, the PR elevation in lead AVR is also in keeping with pericarditis. You don't have any really ST or contiguous um, reciprocal changes. Yes, there is some ST uh, depression in three, uh, but you know, looking at all the features of this ECG, this, this would be a, a clear-cut pericarditis. But more importantly is the story that goes along with this. So young, you know, otherwise healthy person, who's had the viral infection, now getting the sharp chest pain, uh, relieved leaning forward with this ECG, it's all in keeping with pericarditis. So just to recap the MI imitators, the presence of an imitator does not rule out acute coronary syndrome. So we'll refer to Matt when we ask these questions, how does this change what I'm already doing and what are my expectations if I do recognize an imitator and the patient's having chest pain? So again, if there are imitators, uh, the biggest thing is, does the patient fall under the cardiac ischemic protocol? If they do, then you would treat them for their cardiac ischemia. Again, if they, they, they have a story of cardiac, of cardiac ischemia and the 12-lead ECG prints out acute MI, then they would qualify for the STEMI bypass if you are in an area that uses that. Again, with uh, the other, some of the other um, Impostors that we've discussed here, such as the left bundle branch blocks, the right bundle branch blocks, uh, the digitalis effect. Again, these are just nice to know. They're not need to know type of information. Just to, to give you that information when you are looking at that ECG, some of the things that you may see on it and the reason why you may see those things on it. So poll question number five. If your chest pain patients look like they have left ventricular hypertrophy, on their 12 lead, then you do not need to follow the chest pain protocol. True or false? Okay. 
And the answer to that question is false. And 93% gave you that answer, Matt. Excellent. So just before we go further, we um, had quite a few questions that came up um, when we asked for them, so I'll read some of them out. Um, okay, so the first one is, are paramedics allowed to perform right-sided follies in the field? So the right the right sided uh, ECG is uh, not required in the field. In fact, you should not be acquiring um, a 50 meter or right sided uh, ECG or looking at posterior involvement with a 50 lead. So all that is required and is expected is a 12 lead ECG. So do not be putting on right sided leads or putting on posterior leads. We'll do that in the emergency department. So it's outside our scope and we would not be doing that. It will be performed in the emergency room setting and treated as appropriate. Um, so another question was, if the ECG on the screen shows ST elevation, but the 12 lead does not and is not starred, which one do we go with as far as the STEMI bypass protocol? So what you'll want to refer to is your actual 12 lead ECG, and when it prints out, if it reads, reads acute MI or ST elevation MI, it's 98% accurate for recognizing it, so we're going to go with the 12 lead ECG that is actually printed out. Things can look very different on the monitor. Okay, so another question. Um, Although the interventionalist is not directly part of the base hospital, can we take any type of direction from him or her? And the, que and the answer to that is uh, no, you'll have to stay within your, your bypass protocols uh, or any other protocol you're using, for instance, the, the cardiac ischemia protocol. If they're asking you to do things outside of the, those protocols, uh, we'd ask that you uh, politely decline and state the reason why that you must be following your protocol. Let me just add something to that, Matt. So if, um, if a medic does call the interventional cardiologist um, and gets an order, or does not get an order, but a recommendation from the interventional cardiologist, you're also welcome to take that direction to the base hospital physician through a patch. So if there's enough time for you to take that information uh, and then patch to the BHP, assuming it's within your scope of practice, you're welcome to do that too, and you might get the order from the BHP that way. Like Matt said, you cannot take direction or orders from the cardiologist. Okay, so we have a couple more questions that we wish to address. If we haven't addressed your question, could you repose your question because uh, we're missing information or the question isn't clear? So do that at that time and we'll just move on um, for a little bit and we'll, we'll come back to your questions. So, Moving on to tachydysrhythmias, we're going to discuss the causes, treatments, cardiac ischemia, and the rapid dysrhythmia. So causes of tachy tachydysrhythmias include structural, ischemic, uh, related to medication, or physiological. The treatment varies. And however, these patients may present with uh, a form of chest pain. And the question becomes, is this cardiac ischemia, is it related to the rapid dysrhythmia, and how do we go about treating this patient? And this can vary based on your level of certification as a primary care paramedic or an advanced care paramedic. So here we have a rhythm strip. You can take a second just to look at it. You can see that it's going quite fast. It's a narrow complex rhythm. And this is what's known as an SVT rhythm. There's all different types of SVT rhythms. Uh, it's a, a very broad category. It simply means any tach tachycardic rhythm that is generated above the AV node or within the AV node itself, so above the ventricles. Um, types of SVT it would include uh, rapid AFib, rapid A flutter, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, AV nodal reciprocating tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, uh, proxismal atrial tachycardia, so there's a whole grouping of SVTs. And oftentimes what people refer to as SVT, where uh, you know, some of the ACPs may be giving adenosine, is uh, you know, the, the correct one for that is AV node reentry tachycardia. Uh, but SVT is often 
used interchangeably with that. Okay, so now that we're learning how to further interpret our ECG rhythms, the question becomes, um, how do we treat this patient in the field? So our patient may present with this rhythm and or signs of cardiac ischemia. Typically, this patient would complain of palpitations or their heart's, heart is racing or that they're having a fluttering chest. And they typically can identify the onset of when this occurs. They usually present in a rapid, narrow rhythm with a rate of greater than 150. Let's look at our case study. A 66-year-old female experiences a fluttering heart and begins to experience chest pain. Is this cardiac ischemia? The lead two rhythm strip shows a narrow QRS complex with a heart rate of 155. How do we treat this patient? This leads us to a poll question. So what is the treatment protocol that should be used uh, with this patient presentation? Keeping in mind there could be more than one right answer, but choose the best answer. So is it nitro, transport, ASA? or use bagel maneuvers. Mm -hmm. We're only sitting at about 40% voted so far. There we go, there's some more responses. So we've got 8% uh, choosing nitro, 46% choosing transport, 31 ASA, and 15 bagel maneuvers. Okay, so we're going to discuss uh, each of the answers in sequence. So this patient is presenting with chest pain and could be related to cardiac ischemia. According to the heart rate, it's less than 160, and we're going to assume the blood pressure is within the parameters. This patient would be treated with nitro. Um, obviously, yes, we're going to transport this patient at some point, but we do need to intervene with our directives before doing so. ASA administration as well, because the patient is presenting with evidence of cardiac ischemia, uh, regardless of what the cause, whether the cause being the rhythm or the uh, cardiac ischemia causing the rhythm. So it's really important that we get a, a good, clear history um, from this patient. If you answered bagel maneuvers uh, for the advanced care paramedics, it would be absolutely appropriate. Um, of course, you would go to your tachydysrhythmia directive as well and consider adenosine after your bagel maneuvers and then in the case of the sick patient, um, cardioversion. So I think here the important part is to realize that even though we're seeing these rhythms and we're now interpreting them, that we still have to have our patients uh, fit into our medical directive before we're treating them. So although the cause of this patient's chest pain may be the SVT, they are within the parameters of nitro. And if based on your history, you believe it's cardiac ischemia, you would go ahead and treat. I think that's a very important part because oftentimes people with these rapid uh, SVTs will experience symptoms with it. A lot of the times they'll just say, my heart's racing, my heart's pounding. They may say, you know, my chest is, is feeling funny. And it's very important to, to quote, quantify that or qualify that with how does it feel? Is this in keeping with cardiac ischemia? So, you know, go down that line of direction and if questioning, and if it seems like the, this feeling in their chest is in keeping with cardiac ischemia, the discomfort, tight feeling, radiating up to the neck, to the, to the shoulders, down the arms, then yes, that qualifies under your cardiac ischemia protocol. But again, you know, you may have a young, healthy person with a rapid heart rate. They say, you know, my chest feels funny. Again, it may just be that rapid heart rate that they're experiencing, and they're not actually experiencing any type of, of discomfort or, or pain. It's just that rapid heart rate that's being used. Okay, and your uh, medical directives account for the fact that a rapid heart rate could be causing cardiac ischemia, and that's why you have an upper limit of 160 for the administration of nitroglycerin or application of the cardiac ischemia, or ischemia directive. Um, we have another question. So it's kind of related to the Ask Mac question that we had posted previous before. Um, what about the silent MI? Example, left shoulder referred pain that's indicative or the same as their previous MI discomfort, and we have a positive 12 week. Are we okay to treat these patients due to their history? So the patient's basically saying, 
I'm having uh, left shoulder pain, and it's, this is what happened the last time I had an MI. Are we okay to treat these patients with that history? Yes, you are able to treat that patient because they're describing it as typical of their typical pain that they would normally take their nitroglycerin for. In the previous ASMAP question, we're talking about really vague symptoms such as weakness, maybe a little bit of shortness of breath, and nausea and vomit. Although they are associated in some cases with myocardial infarction, if we had a positive 12 week ECG in that case, um, it's important to remember it would heighten our suspicion that this, uh, these complaints are coming from a cardiac origin, um, and we do have the ST elevation, but it could be chronic in nature, and it could be a little bit misleading. So it's important to obtain a good solid history that our patient is um, experiencing chest discomfort, chest pressure, chest pain, or something similar to their previous cardiac ischemic event. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so the gray zones. How do we make these decisions? Um, and because our, our new medical directives have a lot of gray areas, or are perceived to have a lot of gray areas, how do you guys make a decision? So we want to emphasize on getting the history, putting the puzzle together, and asking lots of questions to make a decision, and then going with that decision. Look at your rhythm, what does our ECG show, and how are we going to decide which medical directive to use? So sometimes you may find it, you know, difficult between, you know, using one protocol versus do they really fit into it. Well, the important thing then would be to, you know, explain your, or document your reasons why you've chosen to go down this route. Um, so that's very important is documentation. Good. So keep your questions coming because we're nearing the end of our webinar and we would really appreciate the questions coming in. And again, remember to call your educators as well if you're not comfortable in this forum. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes in the hopes that some other questions come in, but we want to stress the importance of continuing medical education. It's important, but it's also important that you put it in perspective of how it relates to you and your field and how it relates to your ALS directives and the application of them. Obtaining the correct information and the correct procedures is extremely important. That's why you have things like your paramedic educator and the ASMAC application. So we encourage you that if you come across a clinical uh, situation you weren't sure of, call your educator, look it up on ASMAC, and use your resources. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes to see if uh, we have any other questions that come in. Not seeing anything yet, Christine. Okay. I will let you know, though. Okay, we have kind of a long question. We'll try and address. Uh, a question asked. Is benign early repolarization, so one of the, the uh, ST elevation uh, sort of STEMI imitators, does it always present with ski slope ST segment with a peak T wave, or can it present with tombstone type ST segment? And the benign early repolarization, you know, there are 999 times out of 1,000, it's going to be a typical ST elevation with, with uh, the down scooping, not the typical tombstone that you see with ST elevation MIs. So benign earlier repolarization does not present as tombstone type ST segment elevation. Again, with the benign early repolarization, you know, it tends to occur in the younger patient population, more commonly in males. Uh, you don't see the reciprocal ST depression that you would see with an ST elevation MI. So these are all other things that you know, we look at in and determine if this is a STEM versus benign or early repolarization. And again, the benefit that you have working in the emergency department is old ECGs for patients. We often use those to compare uh, their ECGs to see if there are any changes on them, a luxury which unfortunately you don't have in the field. I do have a couple questions now, guys. Okay. Uh, first one that's been typed in. So if you have a patient with a STEMI, so it's been proven STEMI with the, uh, the monitor, uh, who is receiving a fluid bolus, so simply the fact that they're, using, that they're receiving a fluid bolus, uh, are they no longer in the STEMI protocol? Okay, so the assumption is this patient is STEMI positive and is hypotensive, thus receiving a bolus. Right. And if 
um, if I've interpreted that correctly, no, they are outside of the semi-bypass protocol at that time they're uh, excluded. If you bolus the patient and bring their pressure back up to normal tension, they are still excluded. Again, once your patient is out of the directive, they stay out. Good, perfect. I do have another one. Uh, so the medic is asking if the heart rate of the patient is sort of fluttering around the 160 mark and sometimes above and sometimes below, uh, or even I guess one reading at 161 is what they're asking, do they, are they now outside of the protocol for nitro? Okay, so I'm assuming the uh, medic is looking at the cardiac monitor and interpreting that heart rate um, from that. So it would be important at that time to actually manually take your patient's blood pressure, or sorry, manually take your patient's heart rate, um, radial pulse, and then you would have a heart rate. So if it, you know, if it does fall, you need to get a reading of 161 at any point, then yes, they would fall outside of, of the, the protocol. Perfect. I do have another one as well. Uh, and this one sort of brings in the pulmonary edema medical directive. So the question is, why in the pulmonary edema medical directive can we administer nitro uh, to a virgin nitro user if their pressure is greater than 140, but we can't do that with a cardiac ischemia patient? Can you restate the question, Scott, so I'm sure. going to write it down. Yeah. So uh, in the pulmonary edema medical directive, we can give nitro to someone who's never had it, uh, if their pressure is greater than 140, but we cannot do that in the cardiac ischemia directive. Is there a reason for that? Is that Matt Nolgo, maybe? Oh, okay. I understand. So in the case of pulmonary edema, this patient's experiencing high hydrostatic pressures, and the increased blood pressure is going to uh, worsen the left-sided heart failure. So in the um, pulmonary edema directive, you can give a nitro naive patient one spray of nitro, and this is because we're trying to alleviate the increased blood pressure and the hydrostatic pressure that's leading to the shortness of breath from the pulmonary edema. Perfect. And we've also actually referred to that as a challenge in the past. So you're challenging the patient to see if their blood pressure can, uh, can withstand it. And typically speaking, the, the pulmonary edema patient will have a much higher blood pressure than the cardiac ischemia patient overall. Um, and the patient would definitely benefit at that point from a, a lowering of their blood pressure. For sure. Uh, that's all the questions I have, guys. Um, unless there's anybody else out there who'd like to put their hand up and ask something live. Oh, I may have another one. Give me one second. This is great. Challenging. Okay, so here's a question regarding uh, cardiac ischemia pain. So if the patient is showing uh, SVT or PSVT um, and has no history of an MI, but they're experiencing symptoms of an MI, so they're, they're experiencing cardiac ischemia potentially associated with an SVT or PSVT, uh, and assuming all vitals are in parameters, can we go ahead with virgin nitro? Okay, so we're assuming that this is an SVT uh, with a heart rate of greater than 150 but less than 160, uh, experiencing chest pain. Correct. Correct? Yes. Okay, this patient's vitals are within the parameters and they are experiencing chest pain, so they would be treated under the directive. Perfect. And that seems to be all the questions that have come through. Okay, well, huge thank you to the panel. Well done, very interactive, very busy webinar. Uh, thank you to everyone for sending in their questions. It was uh, very busy in the background today. Uh, we are expecting to have another webinar on stroke, which we haven't done in a few years, uh, hopefully sometime this month, if not in early June. Uh, and then we're looking to have our ECG series part three, so a follow-up to this webinar, uh, hopefully within the next month or two. So uh, do keep an eye on your emails and on the flyers that go out. Once again, thank you to Christine, Justine, and Matt for a great webinar, and I uh, wish you guys a great afternoon.